What's up, what's up, baby? You are listening to Speak Now with Jenna. Every final Friday, it's a storyteller's voice. This Friday, Tyheria Williams, better known as Ty. I want to start off by reading um, a little bit of the um, cover of the book. Ty grew up in East Chicago, Indiana. She was beautiful, vibrant, popular, and had big plans for her life. At age 16, Ty began to party and experiment with alcohol like every other 16-year-old in her neighborhood. Shortly after, she was introduced to marijuana, and that's when her life changed forever. Trusting the wrong person can lead you to a dead end, says Ty. What's up, lady, and welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes. So I just want to go on this journey with you. First of all, are you published? Are you self-published or traditional published? I am self-published. Um, I chose that way because I wasn't very very savvy of the, the business of the book. So I went and self-published. Did you have a lot of uh, assistance in the, the, the process? Actually, um, yeah, I started reaching out to other authors to see the process and things and um, a couple a couple authors helped me along the way gave me some suggestions on what I should do and I followed their suggestions okay so there were more benefits to self-publishing because um you were fresh yes it was fresh yes do you have a sequel to this coming I do Mm -hmm. um pure goat 2 will be published I believe in July July yes it's coming up July okay a lot of unanswered questions I get and I need to um, answer those questions. You have to answer those I questions. Do. I do. All right. What prompted you to write this? This is a memoir. Yes. What prompted you at this time to write this? Well, I was in prison mm-hmm. when I when it was conceived. <laughs> because there was a lot of things going on in prison that, you know, I needed to get away. Mm-hmm. So I began to write. Just scribble. Just write. And I would see what I wrote. And I would laugh and I would think about my grandmother and her, you know, things that she would say. And I just take myself out of prison into writing. When I began to write, I put everything in an envelope and I would mail them home to my dad. Mm -hmm. Do not open. Do not open. It was some things that made me cry. It was some things that made me laugh. Just do not open. And so I did a three-year bid that time. From 2008 to 2011. And when I came home. And that's when the book was written. My dad brought me all these envelopes that said do not open. And I put it together. Had you, did you actually remember that you had written that? Or I, I, I think I, when I talk to authors, I hear that it's, a, uh, it's a, actually a therapeutic process. It is. And if you go back and reread what you wrote at the time of your mind state. It will blow you away. Right. That's why I wrote it and mailed it. Wrote it and mailed it. When you read this, does it still blow your mind? It. It. I get emotional. I really can't read it. If I read it and just read it as if I step outside of myself. Yes. And um, it it bothers me. Like it bubbles me. Not bother. Bubbles. I still get emotional on some of them. Some of the things I've been through. Well, I just so admire because there are no holes barred. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> With this, I'm like, oh my goodness, to be able to write that, have the freedom to write yes. that. I'll bet that was a very re- freeing experience. It was a risk. It, it was. Ah, it was. Tell me ri- about that. It was. Uh, are you going to do this? Okay, in order for you to do this, this is going to free you. But this, this, it was just very risky to do. But it, I, that was my answer, to throw up on paper, get it out, release the power or whatever was hindering me. All those incidents, the, the shame and the guilt, I, I bottled it for years. But Ty, even this, when I read this, look, I just read this yesterday. And I've had this like, oh my goodness, I just can't put it down. Even the the being able to put people's names yeah. specifically yeah. into this yes is powerful yes 
Because if I didn't, then that was a form of me still hiding. All I right. needed to release. Wow. So I needed to know who, what, this, that, you know, no harm, but this is what I It's your through. story. Exactly. And you're healing. That's right. All right. There right. you go. That's right. Wow. Um, childhood. It talks about my childhood is filled with fun memories and some that I wish I could forget. However, I understand parents did what they knew to do regarding me. Mm-hmm. Parenting does not come with an instruction manual. Mm-hmm. And as much as parents want to protect their children mm-hmm. and limit the dangers that children are exposed to, there's no way to protect them from everything that can happen. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I, I blame my parents for a long time, my mom, for a long time for things that happened to me. But she just couldn't be everywhere every time. But as a child, you have that expectation of a parent. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you miss that? You know, how did you not know I was being molested or how, you know? And so I blame her and I put her in a basket of you didn't care. But when I grew to understand, you just can't protect them from everything. You know, what's really interesting, too, is the love that you had for your mother, because as it initially started, you didn't even tell her because you saw her being happy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I She always had dysfunctional boyfriends. So this opportunity for her to be happy and be free, I'm going to go ahead and just. I'm just take, take this. it. I'm going to take it. Take one for the team. Yep. Because I want to see her smile. You're a powerful young woman. Oh, my goodness. All right. So this is a very interesting point right here. You said nothing to cause, nothing to cause this, nothing to cause this to happen. But sexual abuse is deceptive, confusing, and almost unforgivable. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So uh, sexual abuse is, um, it's, um, you know, especially when you come from someone who you who who you knew. Yes. Okay. That's where the question marks come, and it it, it deceives you. It, um, you know the knowledge of forgiving, but what happened to you makes you not want to forgive. Um, it's just tricky, and and it's manipulative. Um, and you get treats after you be after after you've been sexually abused. So that's what I mean by, you know, just uh, I want the the cookies and candies and Pop-Tarts, but this Mm -hmm. is what you have to do for it. And it's just so much, it's just a bad thing to Mm -hmm. be sexually abused mentally Mm -hmm. as Mm -hmm. well. Because for me, I wanted this. You're sexually abusing me, but I wanted this. Mm -hmm. So I'm really going for the sweets. Now Mm -hmm. it's happening every day. And, you know, another woman shared with me is, um, you know, that after a while you begin to like those feelings. So you really as a you don't even know what you're dealing with. You're you. Yes, I want that. But and that feel okay too. Yeah, I'm used to it. I'm accustomed now. Right. It's it's I know how to deal with uh, uh, dysfunction. Um, It's become a norm. So now do we do we really call it rape now? Right. Because. It's a norm now. And are you able to identify when a child has been abused? Yes, I am. And it normally stems from anger. When I see an angry kid fighting all the time, like I was, I fought everybody. Ghost. <laughs> I'm just swinging because I was so mad. So at my job, you know, I can see some things that even my family members. What's going on with her? Why is she so angry? Mm-hmm. It's not about this incident here. Something's happened to her and she won't talk about it. So she took lash out on different people. She carried that anger. I was terrible. I fought everybody. I read that in the book. Terrible. Sucking your face for nothing. Talk, talk to me about your friend, you and your friend that hated each other but came together. Oh, my God. Carlotta. <laughs> <laughs> I read the book. <laughs> Carlotta's my best friend. Um, we've been friends over 30 years. And so we were both tough, you know, and she's on the block. I'm on the block. Who going to fold? Right. Right. <laughs> and so she wasn't going to fold and I wasn't going to fold. And so 
we became best friends and just started terrorizing the city. <laughs> <laughs> at 16? No, younger than that. Oh, my. We were, we were friends like at 10 or 11. So, yeah, that's my best friend still today. Still today. Still today. What does she think about this? She's very, very um, proud of me. Um, she's very sensitive when it comes to me. Mm-hmm. I've been through a lot. And when you're best friends and you get take, taken away by a disease, you can't help her. You just have to watch her uh, go down. That was that hurt. That it really did something to her too. Mm-hmm. It was a detachment. It was like a kidnapping. She said, "Wow, that's deep." Yeah. You know what was really interesting is when um, Child Protective Services took your baby from you. Yes. And gave it to your mother. Yeah. Did they know the history of your mom? No. And and you know it was like it's like God always gave my mom. Uh, what's that? Grace. grace there you go uh-huh. that's it he always gave her grace so that week that two weeks she wasn't getting hot wow. you understand what i'm saying oh yes i do so god already knew what was gonna happen so my mom like i don't know what happened with her maybe she had a bad experience that two weeks prior or a month prior mm-hmm. i'm mm-hmm. done with this so when i popped dirty with the baby she was eligible you know she was she was okay mm-hmm. so that's how god did it for me and he um I thought I was okay, but I, I used up until I went into labor. Mm-hmm. And then when I was in labor, my mom would not let me call the ambulance. She was cleaning it up. Cleaning my stuff up. Mm-hmm. Razor blades and bags. And I said, call the mom, I'm hurting. No, shut up. I got to get this stuff up. You got stuff everywhere. So I had to be in labor there. I, would not connect to, I had to be in labor there for... Um, until things got better. What does she think about the book? Makes emotions, I'm sure. Yeah, because you don't want to hear. You you know, mm-hmm. I don't care how bad things get. You don't really want to hear what you've done. Right. Or what you've lacked. And you've lacked, Mom. And I'm, I'm sure I have too. But Yeah, but you have, you own it. Yeah. You have owned it and <clears throat> just God's grace is just all over you. You've owned it. I think my mom is um, on board now with me because this is my healing. Mm-hmm. If I don't get it out and keep trying to protect your feelings, Mom, I'm going to continue to use. So mm-hmm. I had to, I got to tell on you, Mom. That's what the that's what my flesh tells me. You telling on your mama, that's a shame. So I protect her and I won't tell people what she did to me or what she let happen to me. You know, because she was intoxicated. I was gonna say she was in her addiction yeah. as well. Yes. Her disease as well. Exactly. And so this she book don't even so know. blesses yeah. me because there's so many um people that go through this just it just brings it to the surface. Mm-hmm. They go through things. Uh, it even makes me take a look at some things that have happened in my family. But it's just a, a truly a blessing. Let me take you. Let me take you to this right here. <laughs> oh, death and the grave desired to claim me on several occasions, but God has kept me, and I thank and praise Him for that. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah, I've um. I've I've been so close to death, like hanging with a young lady all day. We chilling, we doing everything together. Mm-hmm. Um, she decides to go get in the car with a man to make money. We fight, and I wanted to go. I'm talking about hard fighting. Boom, boom, boom! Hitting your knee on the on the concrete, trying to get in the truck. He killed her, girl. I'm fighting for my death. Oh my. And God saved you from that several different occasions. Many times when you were getting high, mm-hmm. you were on your knees. Yes. And wow. um, and then what? And you thought you were on your knees getting high, but the Holy Spirit would always speak to you to okay. remind you why you really on yeah, your yeah, knees. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did it did? And I I remember I I was down there and I was looking for drugs and everything white that was on the floor. I thought it was drugs. And then I remember being down there. And I remember my grandmother. And she was talking. And I just began to pray. Mm -hmm. While I was down there. 
And I don't know. I don't know why I just began to pray. Lord, please help me. And in the crack house, just praying. Why everybody thinking, you know, she she geeking. Nope. She praying, help me out. I can't help myself, Lord. I can't get up off this floor. Right. I couldn't. So I just started praying. You don't look like what you've been through. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What is What was the easiest part about putting this together, pure gold? There was no easy part. It was not? <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. I, I used, I relapsed a lot of times writing that. Did you really? Yeah, I did. I, I, um, you, when you're writing and when you're releasing like that, you don't go by yourself. Um, you don't ever revisit situations or dark places by yourself. What, what do you mean by that? Well, if I'm going to write about what happened to me, um, that's, you're reliving it. You can, I cried and then I wanted to get high again because I couldn't deal with it. So, so you're saying you should do that? In a therapeutic way? Oh, yeah, most definitely. If you're writing, I, I, I believe everyone needs a team. Mm. I need a team. Someone, a, a Lamas team. Stop. That's good. Push. Wait a minute. Blow. Push. Hold it. Oh, <laughs> you know? Oh That's good. <laughs> yeah, because you need to stop sometime. And then you need to tell it. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you need to stop. Sometimes you need to push and say it. What do you have? What do you have? Um told the story as intense as it is I mean even down to the graphics would you have told this story um, if there was a team or would you have been a little bit more timid to tell the story Um, does that make sense yeah it does Mm -hmm. that right there this needed to come out just like it did raw and uncut I believe um I, I needed to do it just like that. I needed to throw up mm-hmm. just like that for this. But do you have a team for part two? Yeah, I do. You do? I do. <laughs> because it's so it's too emotional, especially with what we, yeah, what yes. we talked about. It's, it's a lot of things has happened mm-hmm. that I probably can't do by myself. Talk to me about the, the process um, of getting away from Kenan. Look at that. I know the name. <laughs> I read this book. <laughs> you hear me? Kenan. Um, do you still keep in touch? I do. Oh, yeah, that's your, like, your children's yeah, father. Yeah, we're like best friends now. Um, he Ken- loved you. I know that. Yeah, he he still does. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, when he was young, and, and, and we did, he thought I was property instead of wife. So, I'm mm-hmm. not, you know, his. So. Why did the military do that to him? Um, or was he like that before he went in the military? He... Had some childhood issues. Okay. You know, some daddy issues and mama issues. And I guess I was the punching bag, whatever. But I fought back. So that's why the the um, fights were very great. But um, as far as getting away from him, I had to really plan it. But Ty, you didn't really get away from him when he was tapping on your tail. But when he put you, when he hit your mom, yeah, that's when you're like, okay. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's this, it. This, this, <laughs> because we can, we can make up. Man, you can fight and make up. Right. You ain't hitting my mama. My mama. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to go. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, no. I had to uh, go to shelters okay. with my children and just follow the yellow brick road. Right. You know, they told me if you go to school, I mean, if you do this, do that, we can get you your own. Blah, blah, blah. Then Keenan and I got a divorce. I got a divorce for a penny. For a penny? It cost one penny. And um, he paid a big time lawyer, wanted to take the kids from me and um, called me all like crackheads and things like that in court. And I won Mm -hmm. and got everything for a penny. He might be still paying for that lawyer. Good for him. Okay. (laughs) So go ahead. You talk from that point on. Share your journey. um, And then I want to know. What's your vision for the future? Share your journey from that point on to, or do you want to talk about um, the gentleman that you actually ended up with? No, oh, yes, I would love to. Okay. So after I left Keenan, I was very happy. I thought, you know, I'm running from one situation 
to another situation. So I'm like, I'm doing good. I'm about to get me a new man. You know, I'm leaving you. I got my own place. I got it going on. I went to Houston, um, began to go to school. I saw this guy. And this guy was very, very handsome. Um, he was dirty, though. He was a construction worker. But he had a little dimple, and he had a gold tooth. And I'm like... And dirty oh, mean he oh, making money. Money, money, <laughs> money. <laughs> so I said, I got me a good one this time, honey. <laughs> and um, long story short, um, that man turned out to be... Um, a deceiver. I uh, fell in love with him. He took he took very care, good care of me. I didn't want for anything or your children. Or, he, oh yeah, he took good care of you guys. Oh yeah, I had two before I met him. So he was just everything to me. My nine shining armor. And um, one day I went to the mailbox um, and opened the mailbox, opened the um, letter, and it said Department of Health. And I'm like, what's wrong with him? What is, you know, it was his envelope, but I opened it. And it told me that. Were you guys married by then? No, we never got married. Okay. Uh, we, he told me that, um, that the letter said that he had applied for assistance for um, his illness. And uh, they named off the, the medications. And it said that he was HIV. And uh, I, I, I didn't know what else. I lost my, I lost my mental. That, that de- deception hits your mental so hard that you don't even know, understand who you are anymore. Because he already knew it. Yeah, he knew. For how long? I, I still don't know. But he knew that he had it. Mm-hmm. And we, we had had sex and every which way possible, he didn't tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was so broken coming from the last relationship. See, we as women, we compare. Mm-hmm. At least he better than him. He ain't hitting. He me ain't hit. hitting me. Right. He might. You know what? I'm just gonna make the decision to die with him. Wow. That's how broken I was. I made a decision to stay with Steve after I went crazy, finding out that he had it. I compared the two as if I had no other choice in life. These were the last two options I had. This is what life told me. Either this, get beat up every day, or HIV. I chose HIV. Wow. I chose risking the chance of catching HIV versus getting a daily beating. HIV came with security. See how the devil disguised it? He, he, it came with security, money, big house, everything, no disrespect. All you got to do is accept HIV. Wow. Or you can go back over here and don't have HIV and just get beat up every day, kick, spit on, have sex when you don't want to. Go over here. Or you can come with nice and calm HIV. I chose HIV. Not only did you choose HIV, you continued on in this relationship and you you had children for this mm-hmm. man. But this is how awesome God is. Go ahead. Tell yeah, it. yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to be good. <laughs> tell it. <laughs> I, uh, I had children with him. I, my mind was made up. And even in my foolishness, God will come through and um, won't protect he, won't you. Won't he, won't he, Yes. Oh. And I don't, you know, today I don't have HIV. Praise God. My kids don't have HIV. Um, it, it, God blocked it. He knew I was foolish, but he knew my intent. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be soft. You know, women, we be, I'm I, me. I was so broken and so tired. That I made a decision. I chose death. Mm -hmm. But the common denominator is love. Mm -hmm. But it really is so much more than that. Because God has a purpose for you. Everything is done for a purpose. So this is just the beginning. Yeah. 
the beginning of it. What I found really interesting is that you had written the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been telling people I'm going to interview this young lady on the sh on the radio. And several people that I shared the book with, they begin to tell me about your story. Yeah, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. So, yeah. What made you finally go from the book to saying, let, let me speak it out into ex the atmosphere? Because um, somebody out there that... Um, don't have the words to say it's a paralyzing it's a paralyzing thing mm -hmm. it's a mute mentally muted that I want to get this out but I don't, don't I don't know how and so me I just want to let you know I'm cut I'm gonna tell it mm -hmm. and, and I can't stop telling it because it keeps me getting high it's because it hurts mm -hmm. and the questions and people think that you're not supposed to have any feelings by things that happened to you when you were five or eight no those things still bother you i don't care how old you are right it those things still bother, and no one never asks you know we we grown now now we got kids and all that stuff is being suppressed suppressed mm -hmm. no one's never just said how you doing well who hurt you you know mm -hmm. so i want to be the face i want to be the voice for them to let them know sometimes you just have to throw up there is no way there's no proper way of getting it out. So I'm going to be telling it. Um, yeah, I'm going to tell it because it frees me. Mm -hmm. And they can tell it too. And it's going to free them. Well, it says in the word, you are overcome by your testimony. Yeah. This was one leg of the journey, many, many legs of the journey. But you've also had some recent um, challenges and here you stand. Yeah. <laughs> Still standing. <laughs> Still standing. <laughs> um, yeah. My body was hit with a uh, Guillain-Barre. Uh, Guillain-Barre is a neurological syndrome that strips the nerves, strips the covering of your nerves. So on February 11th, I was paralyzed. I, I thought it was a food allergy because my face began to twist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, everyone thought it was a stroke. But it was Guillain-Barre um, and... I went to the hospital. Normally went to the hospital. They gave me Benadryl. Boom. I had to go back because my legs began to buck. When I went the last time, they um, told me that I did a spinal tap. Drew some, withdrew some fluid and found that I had bacteria in my spine. Something like that. And I said, okay, fine. We'll just treat it. I just want to use the restroom. And I tried to get up and walk. And they said, I'm sorry. You can't walk anymore. So I was paralyzed from the waist. Just, it's a squeezing syndrome. So it starts with your feet and it goes all the way up. And if it goes to your respiratory, they can put you on a vent, a, a, a trach thingy. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah, so I was paralyzed in minutes. But, you, but they stopped it. Was it you going in early is what stopped it? I don't know because I, when I went in, I went straight to ICU. Straight to ICU. They said, yeah, um, and I couldn't, my hands were, the nerves was, I just couldn't touch nothing. Everything was, I couldn't feel anything. Wow. And I, when I, when I knew I couldn't walk, I just couldn't believe it because I had the knowledge of it. I can walk. You know, you know how to because walk. Because it didn't mess with your brain. Yeah, no. Okay. So I'm like, I'm going to walk. And I could not believe that I was looking at my foot like, my toes sticking out. I was looking at my foot like, come on. No connection. And that's what they said, that the connection was cut off from the brain to the nerves on your, you know, th there wasn't transmitting. Well, praise God, because you walked in here. Yes. Yeah. What was the healing process like? It was terrible. And it still has its days. Was it? Yeah. I'm just going to say, when I when you posted a lot of pictures on say, Facebook, even though you were struggling and going through things, you're like, make sure I look pretty. Hey! <laughs> I was like, look at her. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, get my hair right. right. <laughs> make sure I look pretty before you go live. For real. <laughs> Give me that brush. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, God is so awesome. Tell me about this paparazzi. How did you get involved? <laughs> paparazzi is a hobby. You're a busy woman. I love it. That's a hobby? I love it. Oh. Okay. I, it's like, because 
I love paparazzi. It's <laughs> just a girl's thing. And so I just like, I used to like going, well, I was going live a lot. I go live about everything. In the past, um, and so I like the jury. So I was just buying the jury. I couldn't <laughs> wait till my, my upline Dorian came on and she would have, so I'd be like, 60, 47, <laughs> so for me. And so this guy said, Ty, why don't you do paparazzi? I'm like, no. I just like to buy it. He said, <laughs> I, I like it on you and you have the personality to go live. Right. Just do it. I was like, no, I'm just going to keep buying. He said, I'll pay for your startup kit. I said, now you're talking. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so he just paid for it. Oh, my god! I didn't know him well. I mean, uh, for a long time. I want that piece right there. You got it. Okay. I got I it in want. red, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. It was, and I like paparazzi. I haven't been very secure about going live since of my sickness. And my Please do. I am. Mm -hmm. I am. I got to get some new stuff, but I got a whole bunch of stuff that I'm just looking at the house. You know. Wow. What's for the future now, sweetie? What's the vision for the future? The vision is I'm going to do part two mm -hmm. um, for some unanswered questions. I would like to continue to speak to battered women, um, women in prison. Give us a contact number for you. Yes. Now, mm -hmm. my phone number is 219-242-9914. Will you travel? I will. Mm -hmm. I've traveled a little ways. I went to Warsaw and, you know, I've been back to Valparaiso to speak and things like that. That's what I want to do. I want to make an intimate moment with women who've, who's messed up because mm -hmm. I'm the ultimate mess up. Was. Mm -hmm. And I think that they can receive me better because I've been to the bottom. I'm right. talking about the bottom, bottom. And if they're not messed up, they know somebody else who is. Exactly. Who need to hear this story. Exactly. Yes. And, and then I can give them the mindset of an addict versus you. Oh. Versus you don't understand why he or she is doing that. Or he or she left her children. We're not there anymore. And a lot of people don't understand being addicted. Mm -hmm. We just you think it's a choice that, you know, but. No. So that's what I want to do. I want to be the liaison between addict and whoever on the other side. That's a powerful vision. Yeah. That's a powerful vision. The voice of an addict. The voice of an addict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, part, how can this be purchased? On Amazon. Amazon.com. And what do you look for? Pure gold processed in the fire. Thank you so much for your time. You're so welcome. Yep. You are listening to Speak Now with Jenna right here at 95.7 FM, WELT.